did you know that in 1793, George Washington left Philadelphia in a hurry? We'll tell you later why. And today in the Taste of History, we're making shrimp toast, a lot of tenderloin of beef, mustard greens, and turnip and parsnip smash. Don't you go anywhere. Stay with us for a Taste of History. The recipe we're making today may be sound complicated, but not in the 18th century. Because in the 18th century, it was all about goodness and all about flavor and all about varieties. So for them to make bread and use it for many different forms would be very natural. So what we're doing right now, we're making a quick, what we call a grape batter or a pancake butter, if you will, that is real simple. It's basically flour, flour, eggs, cream or milk, Herbs, salt, pepper, nutmeg, very simple. And all we're going to do with that is we're going to whisk it together so that later our French toast, as we call it, can be easily submerged into it. And the nutmeg is again very important. Remember, don't buy any count nutmeg ever because you might as well don't buy it because the flavor goes away. A little bit of cream or milk, whatever you prefer. And we have some salt. I put a little white pepper in this one because I don't want the sparks to be seen from the black pepper. So white pepper sounds better for that. Mix it up really good. The recipe calls for uh, thyme, calls for basil, calls for parsley. You don't have to. If you have one of the herbs that you don't like, don't worry about it. And all you're going to do with that is add the herbs into it, mix it up, and then let the butter sit away. There we go. The pullman is a salilan, which is a brioche that's baked in a different mold. You want to get like two beautiful slices like so. There we go. Now we're going to trim those slices down. Now, would the 18th century chef discard that? Absolutely not. They would have been used for breadcrumbs or would have been used for stuffing. I have the upper rye already mixed that I did earlier. And I'm going to put this right in there, let it soak a little bit, just a little bit. Okay, let's go back to my fire. Clarified butter, I put it right in here. Okay, so now the bread, you want to soak it a little bit, but not a lot. Just a little to get the flavor all the way through. I'm going to set it. Now let's make an attempt to get it back. Perfect. Perfecto. We're going to make sure that we have some nice heat. Just like so. Oh yeah, couldn't get better than that. This dish would have been served many different ways. The spider is getting warm, really simple. We're going to have some little bit of garlic, a little bit of shallots. You can put some onions if you like, not necessarily. Pan that's getting nice and hot. We're going to add a little butter into it. We take a little regular onion, a little bit of shallot. And like I said, if you like garlic, a little garlic is not a bad idea. And now we're going to put the shrimp into it, right like so. The shrimp will cook at no time at all. I haven't done any seasoning, just as I said earlier, put a speck on the fire, it will take no time. Now, the recipe calls for bechamel sauce. You do not have to use bechamel sauce if you feel like it. You can just, if you have a good fire, a little heavy cream would do the trick. All we're going to really add to is salt, pepper, some little herbs, and a little bechamel sauce, or just regular heavy cream and reduce it down. Take a look how fast those cook here. One of the problems here you have, people have a tendency to overcook shrimp. A shrimp should be opaque on the inside. They're almost ready, but not quite ready. So what I'll do now is I put a little my herbs in there, a little bit of white wine, and a little bit of green. I'm going to put a little bit of uh, salt. 
a little bit of white pepper, and it goes on the fire, and literally, a couple of minutes we're in business. So I'm gonna get the toast over here, while this is cooking. Oh yeah. So now, I got them here. I'm gonna trim some of the little excess, uh, excess batter I have in there. And then becomes something very interesting that you're gonna witness. And I'm told through research that some of the more upland people would have a cutter made, whether it be the family crest or the fleur de lis or what have you. Today, I'm just doing a very easy triangle. So what I'm gonna do here, I'm just cut out a triangle, push it through. Now remember, you can any kind of design you wanna cut out there, there's again no right, no wrong. And our shrimp over here is sizzling away. We're gonna just bring it back to the table. The shrimps are ready. A little bit of the bechamel, as I mentioned earlier, which you do or don't have to use. Like I said, you can use the, the bechamel just by omitting it and put cream into it. It's the same thing. It doesn't really make a real difference. This one over here is my favorite because it really gets the dynamite flavor. Once you eat that, it's just absolutely spectacular. Then all you want to do, you ladle the shrimp in, in the, in the hole that you cut before, put in the sauce, extra little bit on it. There we go. I would just garnish it with a little bit of chervil or a little parsley, whatever you have in your garden, kind of make it really beautiful. And this is a shrimp toast that most people, <laughs> when I tell them shrimp toast, they say, what is the shrimp toast all about? This is shrimp toast. It's basically a toast that is a salilan with herbs and seasoning, and then afterwards you make a hole into it and you fill it up with shrimp. You could fill it with any kind of seafood or no seafood at all. This happens to be one that's been done many different variations, from Martha Washington to Mary Randolph to Hannah Glass. Everybody has a different variation on it, but in concept, the dish is exactly the way it is. We're getting ready for the main course, which is a lot of beef tenderloin, but before that, we want to show you the summer residence of Martha and George Washington in Philadelphia. In the fall of 1793, with the yellow fever epidemic raging in Philadelphia, President George Washington moved his government north about eight miles to the safety and quiet of Germantown. The home of Colonel Isaac Franks becomes the Germantown White House. In this room, we have Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Henry Knox, and Edmund Randolph meeting with the president. They're involved in discussing a proclamation that Washington had issued earlier in the year proclaiming America's neutrality in a conflict between France and Great Britain. We're trying to hold this new republic together. This is George and Martha Washington's bedroom. It shows the Washingtons at a moment of transition. They've just moved to Germantown, and brought two wagon loads of goods from Philadelphia. This is where the bed would be. This is the bedroom of Nellie Custis, Martha Washington's 15-year-old granddaughter. The mattress below the bed would have been pulled out for the use of a servant, possibly Oni Judge. It's just a few years older than Nellie. Oni was Martha's personal maid. This is Washington's Germantown study, where he ran the nation at a critical time in our history. It's also where he ran Mount Vernon. Washington left Deschler Morris House after a month's stay, but returned the following year with his family to enjoy a country retreat for the summer. So what do you think about that summer house? I sure like to hang out there for a while, wouldn't you? Let's get started on our puree, which is made with turnips, parsnips, and potato. It takes a little bit of time. You see, the pan is really hot. So what I'm gonna do right now is gonna add, I'm gonna throw the vegetables into it, in the really hot pan. This is the, the nave, or the turnip, potatoes. And now, I have a little bit of, uh, little bit of onion in here, a couple of pats of butter. So let's see really quick how hot this thing is here. A little bit of garlic, white pepper, salt, 
And the most important part of this dish is the flavor comes from the chicken stock. So I got some chicken stock already nice and hot, cooking over the fire here. Up. Want to put some of this in there? So here we go. And all you have to do now with a little heavy cream in it, you can also use milk if you prefer. The beauty of the dish is when the flavor cooks together, you have obviously, you have the parsnip, you have the turnip, the potato. Makes it spectacular. Have a little bit of uh, chopped parsley with here already. Putting it together in a pot like this, you smell the goodness. But think about it, it could have been eaten any time during the winter time. Because all that would have lived in the root cellar. Back on the fire it goes, and then we're going to start on our beef tenderloin. Okay. Oop. Most people don't realize that an animal really only has two tenderloins, or two short loins. This side would be a New York strip, and over here is the tenderloin. You might wonder the discoloration of this piece of meat. That's what we call dry aged. And even in the 18th century, they figured out real early that if the meat sits up in the proper temperature, mean, mind you, like in an ice house, the, the enzymes start breaking down and it tenderizes the meat. For the, the demonstration today, is I'm taking and I'm cutting out the tenderloin. Now, if this thing would not be a short loin, be a whole loin, it would be about twice the size of that. And I take the knife down to the bottom, getting the tenderloin out. Now, so this one over here later, like I mentioned, would make nice strip steaks or beef chops. The tenderloin, which is right here, now what we'll do is we'll take off the, what I call it, a chain, which is right over here, which is actually a very nice piece of meat that gets used a lot in 18th century cooking for stews. We'll take that. This one over here would make great tips for great tornadoes. And then we're going to take this one here down, which is going to take the outer skin off, like you see me doing it. And then we're doing something that is a forgotten art, absolutely forgotten. So what they had to do, they had to put lard under the meat to get it flavor and to get it some moisture, because the meat itself is pretty dry. So now I have fat back. They would take strips of fat back that is really good aged, mean aged meaning hard. Then you have a special needle that looks like Dr. Physics <laughs> instrument, but it's not. You go in with this needle, and you go in, and you bring it out on the other side, like so. Then you take a piece of the, the lard. You enter it in here. You push your needle back. You push it through. Let the needle guide it. And until it goes like so. Then you do this a couple of times. This is really a, what I would call, think of a moisturizing process. <laughs> think of a good hand cream. It really gets the moisture inside of the meat. And this was done. Now, when I grew up in the Black Forest, it was a regular, a regular happening. I mean, it was not something that was only done once in a while. We did this all the time. It's a little tricky. You want to just get the needle nice and tight, and then you follow through. It may look a little more complicated, you see, it comes over here, and then you leave it out. What you normally do when you do it this way, you cut the outside off because you don't want it in there too much, just like so. That gives you the idea. Now, I'm going to put a little salt, and I have a little pepper. And what I have is a really, really hot pan. So hot that we're going to be into a treat. Now, many a times when I cook 18th century style, I use a variety of lards or different shortenings for this particular dish. I just put a little bit of oil in it because the, the, the tenderloin itself is very delicate. Lots of pepper, go right there like so. Okay, and then oil goes to the tenderloin. This is obviously going to take no time at all because as you know, when you cook a filet mignon, it's the same thing except later what we'll do, we're going to slice it. Remember. 18th century, everything was family style, so it wouldn't have been a fillet for one person. This would have been sliced up. And remember also, they didn't eat a lot of protein like we do today. I mean, having this piece would have maybe fed 10 people, a small sliver. What's unique about it is this dish, I use mustard greens in there. That's obviously it's a, a green that came out real early in the spring. Actually, we saw it down in Williamsburg the other day. 
uh, Ritz in the Snow, a Gross Easy, has a unique flavor, kind of a blanching flavor. It's amazing though, when you think about it, this January and you have all this garden looking so healthy and prosperous. <laughs> I left my chef jacket behind. I'm here with a sweater in the winter garden to really show you how innovative they were in the 18th century. Obviously, people of means who had gardening like that and had fresh green vegetable throughout the entire winter season. Spectacular, absolutely spectacular. The kales, the spinaches, the colors that go through the winter with no protection at all. Some things like the lettuces do take a little protection. I've got some lettuces that I'm quite proud of. This frame is what people today would call a, a cold frame. It just relies on the heat of the sun the insulation value of the box itself. This is an Aleppo lettuce, which you see is a speckled lettuce. A little on the bitter side. Now this next lettuce is a brown Dutch. This was one of the most prized lettuces of the 18th century, both because it was a very cold hardy lettuce and it's a much sweeter lettuce, as well as, as you can see, a wonderfully attractive it's lettuce. Like, like the cousin to the red leaf right now? Yes. The next lettuce is the oldest lettuce in history. This is the cost lettuce, often called the Romaine lettuce today. It's its name, name for the Isle of Kos, which is in the Aegean Sea. Now, many people call this romaine lettuce today. This has to be blanched or tied up. This is going to give you the heart of romaine, which I'm sure you use. Yeah, that's true. Everybody that's watching will know Caesar salad. We also, uh, in 18th century, use this as a vegetable, you know. It gets praised as well, not just eaten as a salad. Oh, yes. You praise it. You like like of, a wilted lettuce. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then finally, we have the ancestor of the modern Boston lettuce. This was called tennis ball lettuce. Yep. It's actually many yep. people were surprised that we even had the word tennis ball. But yeah, because tennis was already played. The difference between a cold bed and a hot bed, I know it's the manure, but what's the technique behind it? Well, these are pit hot beds here. At the moment, we're storing our English daisies and um, China pinks down in here. Now, the difference between a hot bed and a cold frame is the hot bed has this pit. You see it's about 30 inches deep. Mm -hmm. We're storing some hollies in it right now. Yep. Later today, we're going to load this pit all the way to the top of fresh horse manure. It's heated up over here right now. Mm -hmm. Three or four days after that, we'll have a temperature between 130, 140 degrees on the top of the pile. Then we'll cap it off, about four inches of very fine soil. Mm -hmm. Most of what we start in here, the spring lettuces and cabbages and leeks and artichokes, mm -hmm. will be moved to the garden. But we also sow rashes in here for a quick crop of rashes in February. We'll have peas trained along the back, and we'll be picking peas by the middle of April, which is a great luxury in the 18th century. Yeah, I know the technology that you have here to extend the growing season. I'm sure that people were dying for some green vegetables once you had a long winter in front of you. So I assume the people who had the means would use the technology the over, no? had the means like this. But Correct. you're right, greens are tremendously popular in Virginia. Yeah. Everybody's diary fills up in April with they're having beef and greens and yeah. pork and greens. Yeah. We find only artichokes in the, in the wealthier households. Artichokes take a little protection here in Virginia. So they send the winter under the bell glass. Now that's an artichoke, this is a cardoon. Um, artichokes, you eat the flower bug, cardoon, you eat the leaf stem, much as a big celery stalk. Now, the little round red rash mm -hmm. we know today doesn't appear until the next century. Tell me, those guys, what is it? Well, in the 18th century, we call this the turnip radish. You probably know it today as a German beer radish. Mm -hmm. In fact, I understand you eat it with your beer and... Wash it really good, peel it a little bit if necessary, and then we cut it on a bias. So you can actually stretch it apart, looks like a harmonica and you sold on it and you eat it with, uh, with the beer. Almost as powerful as horseradish, not quite, but it has a lot of oomph to it. I use mustard greens, we saw down in Williamsburg, it has a unique flavor, kind of a blanching flavor. We finished it with an ale. This happens to be George Washington's recipe that we have researched. George, like many 18th century uh, patriots, would make their own beers because you couldn't drink the water. This dish is deglazed with an ale. Use any dark beer. Any dark beer will work on it. What's important of the dark beer is the molasses that are in the beer. The sweetness of the molasses together with the mustard green gives this unbelievable flavor. Let me check quick my beef. As I mentioned, it goes quick. The beauty. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's like mind boggling. So put a little bit of garlic in there. You don't have to, a little bit. A little bit of garlic, some shallots and some onion. Now, you don't have to use bacon if you don't want to. You can use a little ham, you can use pancetta. A little bit of bacon just gets unique flavor. Now what I do is I add the mustard green right into it. As you see me doing that. Just, and don't think for a woman I put a lot in it. It wilts down to nothing. Like so. A little more ale, I should say. Any brown sauce would work because you have so much flavor, 
from the mustard greens. So maybe for this, just like two ladles, just put it over. The moment it's wilted, especially the high heat of a dachi, the liquid reduces. If you cook it at home, you want to make sure you don't have too much liquid because the liquid has to be immersed in to the collard greens or the mustard greens or whatever greens you want to use. Literally minutes away from a great feast. Hold on. Many of the 18th century uh, chefs that documented the recipes, like Hannah Glass and uh, Mary Randolph and many others, have made many, many, many recipes that uses turnips and parsnip and potatoes. And why? <laughs> well, simple. The wood cellar was available. This dish could have been made anytime because nothing would happen to it. Now, would they use small little potatoes, large potatoes? It really makes no difference. And the flavor, by the way, comes out of goodness of the parsnip and the turnip, which is very distinct. It's just a forgotten vegetable that for some odd reason fell, was no longer woke. Look at that. So all you want to do, put it in the little container we have here. Parsley on top. Now comes our pièce de résistance. Oh yeah. So now, the way we serve that, we take the greens first, put them on the bottom. Now, as I said, you don't have to use uh, mustard green. You can use colored greens, any kind of greens you like. It's really, again, it really depends what you like. Put the greens on the bottom like so. Now, I'm sure if I was uh, Hercules or any one of the, the great chefs of the 18th century, this would have been the moment of truth to cut this gorgeous tenderloin. So what you would do, you would cut it, and you would cut it on a bias, a little bit like so, and you would go in there, oh here, yeah. and you go, <laughs> you know, sometimes you do things, and you do them because you do them. Obviously, in everything I do, I do because I do. I love what I'm doing, and I love to bring you a taste of history. But days like today, it's just spectacular. Just take a look when you see how the lots are in there and how nice pink this uh, piece of meat is. I mean, just perfectly. And now, we're going to this whole thing on top. A little bit more just on the side, no more than that, put a little parsley on top. This is the meal. You have the beef tenderloin larded and mustard greens, you have the shrimp toast which is the salilan and you have the puree of parsnip and nave or turnips as you call it and the potato. And I'll tell you what, let me try this. <laughs> it don't get better than that, it doesn't. But how beautiful. Now it's not simple, I admit, but it's also not meant for every day. It's definitely a feast for a king. This menu today was a tribute to General Washington. And I'm sure it was served when people came from other parts of the world, because after all, after revolution, hard fought, culinary wise, we wanted to tell the people we were the best. Thank you for joining me for Taste of History. Oh, that is spectacular.